Good morning, everyone. My name is Neera Tandon, and I'm president of the Center for American Progress, and I want to thank you all for joining us for this incredibly timely and important conversation. We all know that the right to vote is one of the most sacred and basic freedoms we enjoy as Americans, and in fact, uh, underscores every element of our democracy. It's truly at the foundation of everything we do. Today, the sanctity of voting rights in America stands at a pivotal and unfortunately a very dangerous crossroads. Make no mistake about it, Mike Pence and Chris Kobach will do nothing to advance the integrity of our elections, and that is exactly what we are here today to discuss. Indeed, later this morning, the Pence Kobach Commission will host its first meeting just a few steps away from this building. Donald Trump has had the audacity to label this group as a Commission on Election Integrity. I should have been done the air quotes around that. <laughs> but that title, and it pains me to say this, like the work of the Commission itself, that title is nothing more than a sham. Instead of working to protect our democracy, this Commission seems to be working to undermine the very element of our democracy by working to truly undermine enfranchisement, disenfranchising voters instead of ensuring that we expand the vote. That's why this commission, this discussion this morning is so incredibly important. Um, we're excited to have two of the secretaries of state of this country who are working to expand uh, the vote instead of undermining it. So today we'll talk about what's happening with this commission, but also what we as a country, what each state can do to expand the vote. It's clear that progressives must take decisive action to protect voting rights in our nation. That means resisting attempts by the administration to collect personal information on every registered voter and to purge eligible registered voters from state rolls. And it also means setting forth common sense solutions that increase access for people everywhere to cast their ballots. At CAP, we believe we cannot just be on the defensive on these issues. We have to have an affirmative agenda that expands rights for all Americans. So I'm really thrilled by the conversation we're going to have today. Today, CAP and the Alliance for Youth Action are releasing a new report that lays out the potential for automatic voter registration and what that will do to transform our elections. It looks at how initiatives can remove barriers which prevent too many folks, particularly young people, from expressing their power at the voting booth. And I look forward to discussing that study and other issues. I really want to thank our amazing panelists who are going to be part of this first discussion, California Secretary of State Alex Padilla and Rhode Island Secretary of State Nellie Gorbea. I'm looking forward to a great discussion, so please meet, welcome them to the stage. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for your public service and, and, and your work, which is generally positive about how to ensure people can vote. That is the job right. of a Secretary of State. Let me start with you, um, Secretary Padilla. I think uh, I'd love to you, for you to just talk from the California perspective, what you're doing as Secretary of State to actually expand <coughs> the vote or to, uh, to focus on the uh, what you can do positively on the issue of access to the vote. Great, and, and, and I love the question because, uh, yes, it's important to defend and protect uh, against the attacks on our voting rights, uh, but as you said, uh, it's not just enough to play defense. There's actually ways that we can go on offense yeah. uh, to expand the franchise and you know maintain the integrity of the elections, but do what federal law requires, facilitates people <coughs> civic participation. Uh, and so I know I speak for Rhode Island too, and we can brag about recent adoption and now implementation of things like automatic voter registration. And if we follow the, the, the evolution here, we've gone from voter registration to uh, online voter registration opportunities and now automatic voter registration, which will systematically add voters to the rolls who are eligible when they apply for or renew a driver's license or a state ID. Uh, and we're talking millions of people. And if you look at who it is that tends to be eligible but unregistered, 
working class communities, communities of color, and a lot of young people. So today's conversation about automatic registration yeah. and millennials couldn't be more uh, on point. But we're also moving forward with reforms that afford voters more uh, options and convenience in how to actually cast a ballot. You know, in California today, you have two options for casting a ballot. You either vote by mail, and a lot of people actually do that already. But if you want to vote in person, in a big state like California, that's a lot of people, you're limited to one location on election day between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m., uh, and that location is close to where you live. So for working families who deal with commutes and picking up kids from school and getting dinner on the table to say, now you have to go stand in line before 8 o'clock, that can be a challenge. So looking at other states like Colorado uh, and elsewhere where they automatically send voters their ballot in the mail a month before election day, and then give voters the opportunity to vote anywhere in the county over several days, not just one day. Yeah. Huge convenience, hugely empowering, and we see turnout go up. So uh, positive things that we can do to strengthen democracy while maintaining the integrity of our election. Victor Gorbea, what's your, what, what would you add to that in terms of what you're focused on? So absolutely, I mean, I ran because I wanted to make elections fair, fast, and accurate. And I think that we can absolutely do that. So in the last two and a half years, we focused on getting new voting equipment for the state of Rhode Island because our voting machines were very old and susceptible to breakdowns. Uh, paper ballot systems with, that basically get scanned. Uh, we did online voter registration to, again, young people. I, I've met young people who actually don't know what a PDF is. So the concept that you're gonna go to the web and download a form mm -hmm. to then fill out is a problem uh, when you're talking to them. So, so how do you go where people are? So online voter registration we've implemented, and then just recently automatic voter registration, and, and I mean in the last 48 hours, uh, it's at the governor's desk, and I'm very pleased to say that Rhode Island is now the ninth state to do this. It's about changing government processes to what people need and want and, and can relate to. So, um, you know, when I in my lifetime, when I was fresh out of college and starting my voting life, you literally had to go to city or town hall to go and register there. Yeah. That was the only location unless you had a, like a specifically designated voter registration drive. Look how far we've come. We just have to make sure that we continue that movement forward and make voting and accessible to everybody across, this, uh, across our country. So as we, as we noted, uh, you know, we now have the Pensacoba Commission. Um, and I wanna thank you both for refusing to provide sensitive voter information. Uh, I wanted to just give you a sense, I wanted to get your sense of what you think of that commission, what you're, what you're worried about, what we should be paying attention to. Una. Well, I'm worried about, honestly, um, the noise that it's creating and detracting from other things that we can be doing. Going back against to, you know, yes, uh, I said very quickly that I would not reveal uh, or, or hand over any kind of sensitive uh, private information that, that Rhode Islanders have that entrusted me with. But then let's not just stop there because I think that's where they want us to be and let's work on what we can do at the local level to make sure that the processes that we have in place in your states and jurisdictions are those that really facilitate people registering and, and, and exercising their right to vote. The, the problem with the commission, uh, sort of where do we begin? So let's, yeah. <laughs> let's start at the beginning. The fundamental premise of the commission yeah. is to try to justify uh, Donald Trump's ego that he did not win the national popular vote. Yes. And because he you, can't you accept the You had a little fact, interaction yeah. with him on the, uh, around this when he attacked California. Uh, you know, I never imagined getting into a Twitter war with the President of the United States, but uh, <laughs> we got to do what we got to do. Uh, and when he called out California specifically, claiming millions of illegal votes, we, we challenged him and, and his team to show us what proof they had. And it's been months and zero evidence because we know it's simply not true. There have been studies, there have been commissions, there have been investigations, and when it comes to voter fraud, they all find the same thing. It is extremely rare, always very isolated. So I think here's the danger of the commission. Despite the facts, which you know, they, they clearly don't have a good relationship in the White House with facts, they set up this commission, which number one, serves as a distraction to the real threat of our elections, starting with Russian interference in the 2016 election cycle. 
right? They continue to deny, they continue to ignore, and every day that goes by that they do not acknowledge and act on what the Russians did in 2016 is another day less that Nelly and I and our colleagues have to get ready for the 2018 election cycle yeah. and make sure we, we maintain the security of the election. Number two, you look at who's driving this commission, technically chaired by the vice president, co-chaired by our colleague from Kansas, Secretary <laughs> Kobach, uh, who has a decades-long, well-documented history of championing anti-immigrant and discriminatory policy and voter suppression policies. And I fear that's the ultimate agenda for this commission, to use this false narrative of massive voter fraud to justify, at a national level, what we've seen happen state after state, right? Since the Shelby v. Holder decision, voter ID laws, reduction of early voting opportunities, uh, creative purging of voter rolls, et cetera, if that's the direction that we're going in, that's not good for democracy. Uh, and so it ignores what can and should be done to strengthen democracy. Uh, address the Russians and what they did last year, invest in new voting systems like uh, uh, Secretary Gorbea just outlined, save and invest in the EAC. Don't eliminate it, the Elections Assistance Commission, which we look to as the keepers of good data and, and best practices information. Uh, and, and fourth, restore the Voting Rights Act in yeah. Section 4 specifically. So I'll come back to both Russia and uh, the Voting Rights Act and a few things you've both mentioned. But I guess I wanted to really uh, dwell on the issue that's raised by this commission and you know, one of the first fights uh, that Donald Trump had after the election, which was to talk about illegal, all, like, illegal voting and massive fraud. And, and, you know, I think there's a, we can all play sort of psychologist and say that's really all about, um, or psychotherapist, really, whichever you'd like, but, um, and say that's really about, you know, fundamental insecurity yet, about not really winning the actual popular vote. But I, I wanted to ask you both about whether there's something deeper there about fomenting distrust in the election system so that people don't feel like their vote will count because there's, you know, some reason it'll get thrown out by some other group or some be canceled out by some, you know, group that shouldn't be voting, and so fewer people vote. I mean, do you think that there's, there's, what, why do you think he went after it, other than the obvious of, like, he was deeply insecure and... Well, look, I think it's very intentional, and all in the category of voter suppression strategies. Yeah. But if you get into people's mind that maybe their vote won't count, or maybe their vote won't be counted, then why should I got, bother to go vote? Yeah. Turnout goes down, the vote is suppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at uh, the recent data request, you know, the personal information of every voter in America that's going to be made publicly available. Oh, yes it is, no it isn't, they're getting sued now uh, as a result. So what do they do in the meantime? The commission who's going to be meeting today uh, says, well, no public comment, Pu the public can't attend and watch the proceeding, but you can email us some comments. And then they expose people's personal information who submitted comments electronically at the request yeah. of the commission. I mean, it's like you can't make it up, really. You can't, you can't make, so, so they're already violating people's privacy, number one. <laughs> number two, the word's out, right? The, the, the president wants on White House computers the personal data of voters in America, and you're seeing that in California, thankfully, but in other states, people beginning to cancel their registration. Yeah. When you cancel your registration, Trump wins. Yes. People who, for fear of their personal information getting out, are counseling the voter registration, the commission hasn't even met yet, and they're already suppressing the vote. That's what's happening. Yeah. No, it's, and, and, and I think, again, but, and, and while all of this is happening, you know, I'm seeing races at a local level where the non-establishment candidate wins. And so my fear is that, again, the, the attention goes so heavily into these areas that, <laughs> that we don't capture the fact that, no, no, really, our democracy can work, but it has to have people participating in it. There's no shortcuts, there's no silver bullets. There's a series of steps that we can take to make sure that people know that they have the right to vote. In Rhode Island, anybody who shows up at the, poll, at the ballot box on, on election day should be able to be given a ballot, whether that be because you were validated through the registry and, of, of voters or you're given a provisional ballot. You don't have to come back later. That, that just, nobody should be denied. Now, but people get it into their heads that things are happening and then, well, I don't know if I should go, if I shouldn't go. No, you should always participate. The one thing we cannot give up on is participating in our elections. Yeah, I would, so thanks for both, both of your comments on that. But, and I just wanted to follow up on this trust issue because now we're, we're getting more and more reports about Russian interference 
in the election, obviously, through email dumps, et cetera, but also hacking of uh, state systems. Uh, you know, initially it sounded very limited. Now it sounds like it's hitting. More, it hit more states. We don't have a sense that it changed votes or anything, but that they were looking at that. What can you do? I think that also feeds a level of distrust about the whole system, which may be why they did what they did. But what can we do in the next two years to ensure that the votes are being counted, that our systems are, uh, you know, as impervious to hacking as possible? Do you want to? Well, Secretary Padilla referenced it. I mean, there's a number of things at the federal level. Absolutely, fund and continue the EAC. That is the federal place where we go to get best practices. Actually, my, my, um, I, I think this commission should start by actually reading the last Presidential Commission on Election Administration's <laughs> report, which actually is a very nice to-do to list about how to improve elections in the country. But, um, and, and a product of recognized election experts on a bipartisan basis, yeah, heaven so, forbid. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I know. So, so doing that, funding you know, new voting systems that are paper-based ballot systems, that have auditable and audited processes, uh, you know, trust but verify. Yeah. And so, um, you know, those are some of the things that I know that we can do in sort of concrete steps. I know that you've spoken well, a lot and, about this. Too. And, and a couple more. First, I don't think we have two years, right? We're less than a year from the primary elections of yeah. 2018 yeah. in many states. Uh, so time is of the essence. Uh, number uh, two, it's... <clears throat> If the federal government wants to have this partnership, right, we just met with all of our secretaries, Republican and Democrat, and the Department of Homeland Security, uh, because we now have a designation of our voting systems as critical infrastructure, uh, with no complete clarity from the Department of Homeland Security on how we're going to communicate, not just to tell us what the latest and greatest firewall or encryption technology yeah. is, but the information sharing. Mm -hmm. Is there chatter? Is there a threat? Are there targets? You know, if they know something that we should be aware of, we need to know information on a real-time basis so we can protect our systems. Uh, and that is slowly coming along. Why? I'm not shocked. There's a lack of urgency from the White House telling the Department of Homeland Security to get on this with secretaries of state across uh, the country. Uh, and so that, that's not uh, helping much either. And the last thing I would say is when it comes to cybersecurity, words matter. And so when we hear a story about, oh, there was scanning and probing in California, right? That's the, the, the online version of, you know, somebody sort of casing out a neighborhood, walking up and down the sidewalk, looking to see, you know, who's home, maybe who's not home. Just because they're scanning and probing, which is very typical in cyberspace, doesn't mean there was actually a breach or an yeah. intrusion. And even when there's a, a, a breach or an intrusion, doesn't mean that data has been manipulated or stolen, yeah. right? So when we use words like, or uh, changed. Election right. systems That's what most people are worried yeah, about. Right. When yeah. we use the term hack, what does that specifically mean before the, the, the yeah. public gets all riled up? So we've got to all educate ourselves on cyber talk mm -hmm. uh, and be precise as to uh, what we're talking about so that we are responsible in how we communicate to the public. So, I mean, one of the things that this whole uh, issue has really mm -hmm. raised is how polarized voting has become. You know, just 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I mean, it's always been, there have always been some controversies, but, you know, generally speaking, most people thought the idea is to get more people to vote, not to get fewer people to vote, to, like, the role of a Secretary of State is to protect the vote. But even in the Russia situation, you had Secretary of the State pushing back against the Obama administration. I mean, it tended to be Republicans pushing back against the Obama administration who was trying to warn the public, use secretaries of state uh, to say that we need to gird up for these activities. I guess I, I and the Voting Rights Act is a, is a kind of fundamental example of this. It used to be the bipartisan support for the Voting Rights Act, then over the last several decades, there's been a way to, a desire to undermine it. We are, we, 2016 was the first election without the Voting Rights Act. And we saw a deep decline in some populations uh, across the country, new voter suppression tactics. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, how we, what we could all do to focus more attention on the Voting Rights Act. But how do we uh, address this fundamental issue, which is, you know, uh, in a democracy, the right to vote is a fundamental one. It undergirds every other right we have. And... Uh, the idea that people can run for office on a platform of trying to suppress it. I mean, nobody says that, but that's what they're doing, and still win. It seems, you know, so f 
crazy on some fundamental level. So I'd love your thoughts on the Voting Rights Act and, and then you know broadly how we can make this a much more important issue as, as, as we go forward. So for me, the, the Voting Rights Act um, is deeply personal. Um, I actually took a, a seminar in college way back when, uh, pre-internet days, um, on, on the law in Hispanic society, and we studied the Voting Rights Act and its impact. And fast forward a few more years later, I was on this Governor's Commission on Hispanic Affairs, and it was actually both the Voting, right Act, votes, Voting Rights Act and the access to the voter file that allowed me to put together a group to file a, a case in federal court arguing that the redistricting of the 2000s had been unfair to Latinos and, and blacks in, um, in Providence. And fast forward now to this day, and I think it's one of the things that I worry about in all these conversations about denying access to the data, that we not do it in a way that's so capricious that we create more problems down the line. That, that holding our government accountable absolutely requires us to have access to data. Now, if somebody's gonna use that data inappropriately, now that's a whole other issue. And things like the Voting Rights Act give, gave us a, 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 a guide as to how to do things evenly. And, mm -hmm. and so if you're gonna clean a, a voter list, these are the processes by which you have to hold yourself by. Um, I think that we need to make sure that in the next Congress and, and, and going forward, I know it's gonna be a hard sell, but um, who knows, maybe in 2018 we can, we can do this, um, get the Voting Rights Act restored so that we have, again, a level playing field and, and, and some agreement on what are these procedures for taking people off lists and how do we conduct uh, elections in this country. So how do we get Congress to yeah. restore the Voting Rights Act? Uh, or just make it, it, it a more, you know, like people can't run for office basically on a position of, I'm restricting people's votes. I right. mean, it so, just does seem so, so we got to fight. We can't take it like these attacks on voting rights uh, lying down. And I'm hopeful because of the level of civic awareness and engagement that we've seen in the last six, seven months. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, civic participation does not is not limited to voter registration and voting. It's also what happens between elections. Yeah. So look at what happened in the last six, seven months. There has been, uh, for the more than there's been in a long time, levels of protests, marches, and rallies. Uh, attendance at town halls, right, whether yeah. it's about health care or anything else, you know, record contributions to, to ACLU and Planned Parenthood, hopefully Center for American Progress too. We're working uh, on it. You know, there, there, there's a lot of uh, awareness and involvement and passion in the American people right now. Uh, and we just got to channel that. And part of channeling that is make sure every member of Congress hears it uh, on a consistent drumbeat, restore the Voting Rights Act, restore the Voting Rights Act, until they actually do. Are you seeing people increase, <clears throat> are you seeing any actions of people increasing voting, or not voting, but registration? But, uh, well, we're seeing, absolutely, we're, we're seeing increases with regards to civic participation. Um, the, the Rhode I in Rhode Island, for the first time ever, we have a Rhode Island uh, Women's Caucus in the Democratic Party that's now going on its seventh or eighth meeting with, like, 80 committed women, like right. all getting together and doing things. And candidates are starting to pop up from there. Um, you know, uh, one of the, the members just got elected last night in the, in, well, in the, as in the primary yesterday in Newport, uh, Don Ewer. And so, so you're starting to see not just the rallies in the march, which are good and, and emotional and stuff, but how do we channel that into constructive, positive, and ultimately the change that we want to see in our society? And it's by running for office, contributing to organizations and candidates, and, and, and hitting the, the ground. Yeah. Great. Uh, we have time for some questions. Um, just if you, can, uh, if you have questions, just raise your hand and identify yourself, please. And then uh, we'll try and go through, uh, try to get to a series of questions. Are there questions? Over there. Hello. Uh, I work on the political side and work for political parties in the DNC. One of the things we worry about is, in terms of the access side, the Republican Party, like the Democratic Party, maintain a national voter file. It wouldn't have the last four of the social, but it has everything else. Could this commission just go to voter vault on the GOP side and then access the 50 state file and not go through you guys? Uh, I mean, it's, it's possible. I've heard uh, the <laughs> argument by the commission uh, that, well, we're just asking for what's already publicly available and 
They listen. You know, every state, aside from federal privacy laws, every state in the nation has its own laws on what the voter file can and cannot be used for and by who. Right? So in California, for example, is some elements of the voter file available for political campaigns for outreach? Yeah. That, that's a defined use uh, in state law. Uh, is it available for academics, for scholarly work? Yes. Not all uh, information about a voter, some elements for that stated purpose. Uh, but this commission, and uh, with, with unclear intention of what they're going to use it for or how to protect that data, it is not written as carte blanche in the state of California. So no, voter information is not public information. It is publicly available to certain folks for certain uses, and that's a big conflict and tension between this commission and where they're headed. Yeah, I think it does seem he's raising a good worry, which is that they could just get it from the RNC or something, but... But they won't have complete information yeah. that they're asking for, and maybe not as current information. And so yet again, once they yeah. take old information and start these you know, cross-checks against other federal databases that they've said that's what they're going to do, it's been shown before. They're going to have a ton of false positives and they're going to be canceling the registration of a lot of eligible American citizens. Uh, that's the net effect of, uh, of, of all this. Yeah, so is that what you're, I mean, just to make clear for the audience, I mean, I think the deep concern is that essentially they'll take the data, claim that they're, they'll claim by cross-checking that there's people who shouldn't be there so that they can make the case that there's kind of widespread fraud. I mean, they're basically trying to make a, an argument about a, a claim they've been making for a very long time that has heretofore no one has actually found any evidence for. Exactly. Is that your I mean, sense? Can, can you imagine how many John Williams and Mary Smiths there are in the United States of America, uh, let alone juniors and senior John Williams in the same household? Yet when, you know, the, oh, there's a match. Here's two people by the same name, you know, double voting. Well, that's not always the case, folks. Uh, so uh, that, that's where we're concerned that uh, uh, abuse and misuse of uh, inaccurate data is going to lead to the disenfranchisement of millions of Americans. And, and, that, and what's, what's, I think, really key is, again, we need to have the data available for, for purposes, you know, in, in the community, like you're talking about, um, when we have to be very vigilant about, you know, what's going to happen afterwards with the data so that when that, those lines are crossed, we can trigger the, the challenges, the court case. I mean, right now, there's an injunction nationally to sending any information to the commission, as it turns out, because of the two court cases by the ACLU, and then there's another group that filed. And so we actually got a letter back saying, like, oh, don't send us your data right now because <laughs> there's a court injunction. I'm like, okay, fine, no, no worries. Um, but, you know, so, so there's, we are at, at the beginning point of this conversation, but we can't lose track of, of the other parts of the conversation further down, and we have to be vigilant all along. We can't get tired, I mean, about yeah. this. That's, we, that, that goes for everything, yes. not just voting. <laughs> Over here, there's a question. Do you have a question? Oh, that's just okay. I mean, if you don't. Gail Gottlieb, um, Women's National Democratic Club. Uh, I noticed that uh, some Republican secretaries of state has, have actually issued really strong statements against the sharing of this information. I'm just wondering, do you see any potential of working with those Republican secretaries of state on other voting rights issues other than simply the sharing of information? Uh, I mean, opposing the sharing of information. Well, we'll always keep hope alive, right? And, and that, that, that they'll come around it and see, uh, see it the right way. Uh, and, and I have reason to be optimistic. You know, a couple weeks ago, we were at uh, the National Association of Secretaries of State's conference, Republicans and Democrats around one big table. There's a lot that we agree on, a few things we fundamentally disagree on. But on this issue of you know, the, this data request by the commission, uh, it was unanimous and bipartisan that the, the answer is no, it's inappropriate, and uh, states are pushing back. And it was a weird request. I mean, we all know that you can't hand out people's social security numbers. So why would you even ask for it? And, 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 and maybe in, in, in the context of this last year, you know, last fall, even before the election, when there was chatter about potential hacking or rigging uh, under the Obama administration, Secretary Johnson of Homeland mm -hmm. Security began to entertain the conversation of designating our voting systems as critical infrastructure. And you heard a lot of Republican secretaries very emphatically say, stop. <laughs> The Constitution say, says states run elections, the federal government has no, no role here, go away. You know, change of administration, 
now it's Republican at the White House, Republican Congress, and a, and a commission saying, oh, we're going to gather and aggregate all this data. Where were the Republican secretaries then on the pushback, on the same argument? It may have taken them a minute, but most of them got there. Right. We had one question at the back. I think we have time for just one more question. Valerie Crotty. I served as uh, chairman of the Florida Elections Commission under Lawton Childs. We never saw a legitimate problem with voting. It was generally a clerical error, somebody <laughs> trying to vote in the wrong precinct, that sort of thing. Even though Florida, as you know, has had other problems. <laughs> <laughs> My question is this. What are we doing about getting those people who are already registered to the polls, making them understand how important it is, particularly in primary and local elections where we're voting anywhere from 13 to 27 percent. What do you, how much do you see your role as actually also, you know, pushing people to actually vote, however they vote, I, but pushing I, people? I, I think that's critical, um, and I think there's the, the answer that uh, again, there's no silver bullet on this on this public policy problem. Um, it can be. Everything from how we're communicating with voters. For example, when I came into office, I completely redesigned the voter information handbook. There have been times when the voter information handbook, to me, and I, you know, I have a master's degree in public administration. I love this stuff, but has not given me guidance as to what it is exactly that I'm voting on. Where I've read the question, I've read the analysis, and go like, I'm not sure what I'm doing if I'm approving. So, like, no, we have to put these things in plain English. We have to design them in a way that's attractive, that says, because if you have a voter information handbook that goes to the voters that people don't care to read, it basically is telling them, wait, you, don't, you can't even read this? Why are you even showing up to vote? You're too stupid to vote if you can't understand this. And so those are, there's all these subliminal messages that we're getting out across to voters that I think are as part of the solution as much as things that I think are also incredibly important, like early in-person voting, um, you know, making sure that mail ballots are accessible, that we have provisional ballots on election day that are readily accessible as well. So there's a number of, of ways that we can do this. And I encourage each and every one of you to think about those points within your own community that can be moved forward. Not, not just one, but, but what are the different ways in which in your own community you can make voting more easily accessible because uh, that's the beauty of our system, right? We have a lot of local input, a lot of local control into our election systems. Right. So, uh, you know, I mentioned automatic voter registration earlier because if you're eligible to vote but not registered, you don't even get the voter information guide or the sample ballot. Uh, we talked earlier about affording more options of how to cast your ballot once you're registered. But kind of picking up on Secretary Gorbea's uh, comments, we too have redesigned our voter information guide to make it more attractive, easier to understand. And because of the required legalese, California's voter information guide last November was more than 200 pages. So yeah. we did, so we did what I used to really do in college. <laughs> I asked for a cheat sheet. Yeah. <laughs> and so the first 18 pages was sort of a quick guide in more, in more plain English. Of, of how to navigate your selections on the ballot. Uh, there's the power of technology. Uh, we're not just, you know, social media platforming a way to, to a more engaged electorate. We launched our first agency app, right? So in your hip pocket, quick, uh, at one touch of a button, online voter registration, verifying your registration status, where's my polling place, quick guide to propositions, which also has some helpful campaign finance information. Uh, but for all the technology that there is today, there's no substitute for a personal invitation to participate. So every time we go to a high school or a community college or a community group, we're asking others to do the same. Talk to friends, talk to family. When we raise the level of civic discourse in our society, we're all going to be better off for it. And, and also take the opportunity of when new things are happening. For example, we bought these new voting machines in Rhode Island and along with it, ballot on demand printers. So now we can print small batches of the ballots. And, uh, I've offered all high schools in Rhode Island, both public, private, charter, everybody, um, the opportunity to run their student government elections on real ballots with real voting machines. Why? Because if your parents don't take you to the polling location and then you're now 21, 22, 23, whatever, and you're going to vote and you've never done it before, you don't even know what it looks like, again, it's that hesitancy to take time out of my life, which is really crazy, to go do something I've never done before that I'm not sure I'm going to look stupid doing. So 
let's let's ease people's concerns around that by giving them the opportunity to do this. Plus, you get to see, the kids get to see their own names on a real ballot. It's kind of cool. <laughs> so, so again, there are many, many ways in which we can continue to further this agenda forward that don't necessarily, you know, have to do with the commission that each and every one of you can take a part of. It's a great ending to this conversation. I know that you guys have to go do really important work on the same issue. So I want to thank you both uh, for being here and also really for what you're doing to expand, uh, not subtract from <laughs> the voting, from voting in America. So, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Liz Kennedy, for the next conversation. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Liz Kennedy. I'm the Director of Democracy and Government Reform here at the Center for American Progress. Uh, thanks for being with us this morning as we discuss both the attacks but the advances as well in uh, voter registration and participation. So glad to be joined by this tremendous group of leaders at the forefront of the battle to remove barriers and maximize youth voter participation so government is reflective and responsive to the millennial generation. Uh, I'll spend a couple minutes just sharing who we're with. Uh, Sarah Adello is the executive director of the Alliance for Youth Action, a nationwide network of organizations building political power for young people. Uh, AYA's affiliate, the Bus Federation, played a major role in passing AVR in the state of Oregon. And Sarah is also the former policy director for Generation Progress. Um, so we're excited to have you the family. back here with us. Exactly. <laughs> um, Stevie Vales is the executive director of Chicago Votes, a youth-centered nonprofit seeking to build a more inclusive de democracy by putting power in the hands of young Chicagoans. Uh, prior to joining Chicago Votes, Stevie worked as the national campaigns director for the Alliance for Youth Action. Um, and coordinated major projects, including National Voter Registration Day, which resulted uh, in over 777,000 new registered voters in 2016, probably, yeah. Um, yeah. and the American <laughs> Voter Guide yeah. Project. Mm -hmm. um, and then my own colleague, Maggie Thompson, um, is the executive director of, uh, for Generation Progress, uh, and prior to joining Generation Progress, which is the youth action Sorry. arm yes, <laughs> here at the Center for American Progress, uh, which is terrific. Um, and prior to leading Generation Progress, she worked as the campaign manager for the Higher Ed Not Debt campaign, which is the na nationwide multi-year effort to ensure that a quality higher education is affordable and accessible to all, and all sorts of other terrific things. Um, so, Maggie, let's start with you. Uh, oh, I also have to mention that we put out, when the Secretaries of State were discussing um, kicking people off the rolls with uh, bad data matching, just yesterday, uh, CAP released a project uh, called Keeping Voters Off the Rolls, looking at the impact of documentary uh, proof of citizenship requirements and illegal voter purges, um, with a lot of the real uh, studies of past instances where these horrible practices have been used to silence American vo uh, voices. So please do check that out. Um, and now on to potentially the better uh, world that we can all build together. Um, millennials outnumber baby boomers as America's mm -hmm. largest generation. Yep. A fact that was new to me. Yep. Uh, by 2020, young people <laughs> are expected to make up, <laughs> I'm learning every day, uh, expected to make up 40% of the eligible voting population. So can you speak to some of the unique qualities that make up the millennial electorate um, and how you think they might shape politics over the coming decades? Yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, for us at Generation Progress, I say all the time, millennials were not only the largest generation in American history, we're the most diverse and the most inclusive. So really when we're talking about how to engage this generation, that's the thing for us to keep um, at the forefront of our minds. I think that you know, just as an example, the average age of a Latino voter, any Latino voter in the United States in 2016 was 27. So really, uh, those we have to be deliberate in thinking about not only uh, the sort of inclusive values of our generation, but also the diversity of our generation when we're thinking about how to engage them. And for us, as a policy solution, 
Uh, it can't be done in a vacuum. Automatic voter registration is not the one thing that will fix all of the issues that we have with our voting system, but I do think it's the single most impactful thing that policymakers can do in order to engage the millennial generation. But I also think, almost more importantly, to regain the trust of our generation. Uh, millennials, because of uh, our lower voter turnout, the sort of knock against our generation is that we're not engaged, we don't care. Um, there's less discussion of the structural barriers millennials are facing when they go to vote and the other types of civic engagement that our generation engages in as leaders in their community. So, you know, this is, this is the best first step that states can take to really engage our generation, not just to get the numbers. I mean, that's the end game is getting the percentage of young people that are voting in our elections, local elections, special elections up and higher. But really, this is about regaining the trust in institutions our generations have has lost. Um, you know, just thinking about the average interactions a young person has with government. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that's so striking in this report, even in the voting system, is that 25 percent, one in four millennials, when they go to vote, are asked to at, cast a provisional ballot. A lot of times because they moved, a lot of times they don't understand what that means. There's not always a consistent message at the polling place of what that means. And then other interactions with government, frankly, are not uh, sowing trust. Uh, you know, your monthly call from, uh, you know, a servicer with the Department of Education to pay your student debt. For your young person of color especially, um, our, you know, our police department's really sowing trust in your community. So this is um, about voting, but it's also about earning back the trust of our generation and engaging us for the long term in the system. Yeah, and I want to, I think that's a critical point that I want to return to about the distrust of institutions. Mm -hmm. um, talking about youth voter participation, Sarah, young people have demonstrated their interest in the political process, heading up political campaigns, leading social movements, volunteering in their communities, obviously terrific organizations led by young people. Um, still, only 46% of young people voted in the 2016 general election. Um, so what do you think some of the obstacles that young people encounter in the voting process that that might be keeping them from making their voices heard. Yeah, I mean, and we know that uh, voter registration is one of the biggest obstacles, and that's one of the reasons why we're so excited for automatic voter registration because it's a super seamless process. It's an opt-out process, so that when you are interacting with the DMV, whether it's because you're getting a license or because maybe you just moved, right, and you need to get a new license, uh, not just for the first time, but because you have a different address. But in Oregon, that that's when it was automatically updated, so it was it was just easier, right, and. So we have this like first universe of the challenges, right? Are certainly just, are young people registered at all? A lot of times we forget that young people are not just young, but they're first time voters. And like Secretary Gorbea mentioned earlier, it can be really confusing. I mean, a lot of us do this work, but when we get our own ballots, we're like, wait, who are these people <laughs> further down the ballot? Who are, who are they? And I don't, and there's pressure to make the right decision, right? You want to be engaged, but, when in California, Secretary Padilla mentioned a 200 page book with all the information that you'd need to engage in that ballot, that's really intimidating. So we have to make it easier for, for people to engage and understand, all right, who are the folks on the ballot? What do they stand for? Are they with me and the values that I, that I stand for and what I'm fighting for every single day? Um, that's one of the things that we work to do is to make sure that voting, voting is accessible. Yep, we're gonna hustle to make sure young people are registered, but we're also gonna put easy to understand information in front of them about who the heck is running. We're, we, like many others here, are also pushing campaigns to say, hey, get in front of young people, fight for their votes. We deserve to have our, votes, our votes fought for. Frequently, when our organizations are getting on the doors to, to engage in GOTV and increase turnout, a lot of people are saying, oh, no one's ever asked me to vote. No one's ever come to my neighborhood before. And I think this is especially uh, the case when we're looking at, yes, young people, yes, people of color, and then the intersection of young people of color, right? And so for us, we want to make sure that, yes, that we are um, saying that, yeah, your vote's important, and we're going to make sure that candidates are fighting to get your vote, but we're also going to work to educate you to make sure it's easier to engage and, and you feel comfortable saying, yep, you know what, this is a person who represents uh, what I stand for, and I'm going to vote for them on election day. We have a lot of work to do. The systems mm -hmm. are certainly a big, big part of it. Like Maggie raised the issue around pr pr provisional ballots is ridiculous. Could you imagine, for me, how many of you have ever had a provisional ballot, filed a provisional ballot before? Right? Can you, for those who haven't, can you imagine voting? And then saying, you know what, this, we're going to give you a provisional ballot. Like, what, what would that make you feel about your engagement on Election Day, right? Way to, like, suck all the air out of what should be a really exciting <laughs> yeah. day, right, um, in our democracy. Mm. Yeah, excluded, really. So mm -hmm. 
Um, and Stevie, I think in terms of getting people to pay attention to the issues that, that young people care about that Sarah just raised, uh, millennials are facing a unique set of structural economic challenges, uh, the, including the you know, $1.3 trillion student debt crisis, yeah. a negative savings rate, youth unemployment uh, rate that is twice the rate of all workers. Yeah. Um, how can increased access to the ballot help young people improve their circumstances and then really build power? Uh, for future generations? Yeah, so in my opinion, like the, the more barriers that you take down, the more you can communicate about the issues that really matter. You know what I mean? I think, like Sarah said, when you go and vote, you have pages and pages of pages of people to vote for. Uh, and there's people that, me who work in politics, they're people I've never heard of. You know what I mean? And I work in politics. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that I spend half the time trying to get people registered and eligible to vote. I don't get to spend as much time as like we would like telling people what to vote for and what people running for specific offices actually do. You know what I mean? So I think taking down these barriers like voter registration, getting rid of it um, through uh, meaningful policy changes like automatic voter registration takes uh, takes a lot of the pressure off of us who are doing the work on the ground um, off of trying to get people to register to vote and it allows us to talk more with folks about the issues that actually matter to them you know like a vote for the president is going to directly impact your student debt a vote for a state's attorney is going to directly impact how you're going to interact with the police a vote for a specific judge is going to directly impact what the sentencing is going to look like for low, mar low, low marijuana possession. Um, and a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people just assume a vote for the president impacts all of this. And I voted for the president and nothing is happening in my local community. So being able to talk more about local offices, being able to talk more about what these offices actually do is going to uh, help draw a correlation between voting and the issues that matter to young people and getting rid of voter registration as a barrier will allow us to talk more about that. I did think that was one of the great, um, a really neat point that we uh, included in uh, the paper that was released this morning by all of our, our organizations on how millennial voters really win with automatic voter registration was that, you know, when the uh, Oregon bus, now the Alliance for Youth Action, uh, <laughs> was looking at how much time they had spent working to register voters in Oregon once the state just used their own technologies to facilitate, you know, lower those barriers and use the modern technologies to add those eligible people to the rolls, it frees up the time and space in civic engagement organizations <coughs> to actually turn towards voter education. Um, yeah. And and, yeah. and the Oregon bus who, like, had, like led this effort in, um, in Oregon and has done such amazing work. Like even since then, they just hustled with a bunch of other groups in Oregon to pass pre-registration for 16 year olds, right? Yeah. And so it's like, let's get through registration to then talk about all the other issues that young people care about. Certainly, again, AVR is not the end all be all. There still are other voters that we need to work to engage and to register, but it does open up a lot of space for our groups to say, what are you passionate about? Well, let's work on that and let's mm -hmm. work on fighting for that change. Yeah. And we found that the Center for American Progress study on the impact of AVR in Oregon actually found uh, that more than 40% of Oregon's, the people that registered to vote through AVR, 40% um, of them were younger than 30, and 30% of the folks who used AVR to then vote were under 30 years old. And that's as compared to a population uh, in Oregon where only 20% of Oregonians are below 30. So really having a tremendous um, effort there. Do you, have you heard what kind of feedback from elections administrators or from voters um, since AVR was implemented in Oregon? Well, and when it comes to voters, we haven't heard much feedback, and that's great news, yes. right? <laughs> like, it, we Some shouldn't points. be hearing feedback, right? The idea <laughs> that it should this be so seamless, right? That you're just registered, mm -hmm. that you get an opt out. What happens in Oregon is you interact with the DMV, and then you get a form um, to say, like, to be able to opt out. Mm -hmm. And for people to be like, oh, 
I'm registered. Like that's generally been the response that we're getting is, oh, I'm registered. That's awesome. The fact that you don't hear noise about this by voters is a great thing because it shows the system is working. In terms of what we're hearing um, from clerk's offices and the like, they're not getting the big surges in registration, which is really helpful. Yeah. Um, a lot of times the data is just like much cleaner uh, for them as well. Uh, it's You're not having to deal with some legi legibility issues, you know, when you're filling out forms and the like. So. Um, and in this way, we, I think this is an instance of no news is great news. Um, and, and that's something we're really excited about. Yeah. And I just wanted to drill down on, on what Steve was saying, especially about sort of um, how this can let us talk about the issues that young people care about. And it's not just in the macro, sort of saving the time and resources of organizations. I mean, it's literally when you are on a voter regist registration drive, your time at the door, your time um, at, at the gas pump. You're, I know on when the I, quad. I, on the quad. Um, I was on a campaign once where I was sending my staffer with a motorcycle out to chase tractors because we were in South Dakota and it was harvest season. So we're looking for voters <laughs> everywhere. We can find them. <laughs> And when you get that voter and you get their attention, like the number of times I've felt like that's a wasted conversation because you're going through, okay, well, this box means this, and you can either do your the last four digits of your social or this identifier, and that you're 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 wasting that valuable time on boxes and forms instead of being able to have those conversations about issues and engaging someone on why this is important. So it's let's just keep the logistics um, in places like the DMV where they belong because that's already where logistics lives. So let's keep them there yeah. and then have the debate and democracy happen in the field and that's what AVR does. Exactly. We're just, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, it's really fitting for millennials to be leading the charge on adopting AVR because it's really just using the kind of modern technology that already exists just in a more efficient way to support uh, political participation. Mm -hmm. um, so again, human to human contact can be spent on these critical issues about like the direction of our country, free and fair self-governance, what's happening in the world, all of these and in people's lives. I mean, we're interacting with government all the time. So why why shouldn't we just be automatically registered? Whether it's a DMV, whether it's WIC, whether it's Head Start programs, whether it's the public school systems in our country, we interact with government all the time. Like, government has our information. <laughs> we know this. Why doesn't it just mean that we're able to participate? Exactly. As long as the government here in the state already knows the information that they need to, to be able to confirm a voter's eligibility, then they can just add them to the roles and maintain people's opportunity to, to opt out. And then it's still, of course, up to each individual as to whether and how they end up casting a ballot, uh, but this just takes away this first, you know, kind of speed bump. Um, in terms of passing AVR in states, uh, Stevie, AVR legislation passed through both chambers in Illinois earlier this spring, still awaiting the governor's signature, mm -hmm. kind of yeah. bated breath on that one, uh, but we know that as opposed to last time when he vetoed it, mm -hmm. uh, this year he has indicated that he will uh, be supportive. Um, can you talk about Chicago Vote's role in winning the fight for AVR in Illinois and just kind of what messaging uh, resonated with lawmakers or with the public? How were you able to engage people in demanding this policy change and maybe what challenges you faced? Yeah, so one of the things I think that uh, was really important for us on, we, we were part of a coalition in Illinois that uh, came together as a joint effort to pass automatic voter registration. Uh, each member of that coalition was given a task of the general public that they were going to engage with and educate around the issue. Our task was to engage with young people. Um, as we said earlier, uh, young people are the most diverse. Uh, we're also the poorest. Uh, we're also the most progressive. Um, <laughs> and we're the biggest generation in American history. So uh, we had a lofty task. Um, all we do at Chicago Votes is centered around engaging, um, educating, and developing young people. So we engaged as many young people as we could around uh, what voter registration is, like why there is a voter registration system. You know, the voter registration system was established uh, for white men who owned land. And ever since that was established, we've been fighting to push that back. Mm -hmm. And it's still structured that way for, you know, you gotta show that you have the privileged resources in order to be a registered voter in this country. And that's not fair. And so we're, what we're trying to do is break down those barriers and automatic voter registration is one of those barriers. So that's how we communicated with the general public because the general public, what we were communicating with was primarily black and brown youth in the city of Chicago. Uh, how we communicated with the legislature, um, it just made sense, you know. Uh, 
it's, it makes sense financially. Uh, on average, a paper registration form in the state of Illinois uh, was about $3 and some odd cents per registration in order to process. With automatic voter registration, it's estimated that that's going to drop down to about 10 cents per voter registration to process, so it's cheaper. Um, it's bipartisan. Uh, not only did it pass in the Illinois legislature with no votes casted against it in either chamber, it passed with no opposition out of both chambers. It's passed in other states across the entire country with bipartisan support. Um, and it just makes elections more efficient. You know, uh, one in eight voter registrations are thrown out in Illinois because somebody doesn't check a box or somebody doesn't know the last four digits of their social security number, which you have to put on a voter registration form. It's ridiculous. Or somebody doesn't know their driver's license number because nobody knows their driver's license number off the top of their head. <laughs> um, so people don't fill out these boxes. And when people don't fill out these boxes, that's, uh, that's a mistake. That voter registration form is then thrown out. And these people who think they're registered are not registered. Um, so in many states, luckily in Illinois, we've also passed online voter registration and same day voter registration. So we are able to battle back against things like that, where people can show up to the ballot box and be like, oh, I'm not registered. Let me do it right now. And then I'll be good. And I can vote. doesn't happen on election day, but you know, that's another battle. Um, so yeah, that's how we communicated it to the legislature. It made sense. It was cheap. It was bipartisan. It was more efficient. Uh, Governor Rauner vetoed it the last time because he said there wasn't enough securities in place to make sure only eligible people were able to vote. But like Sarah said, like we already go through the DMV, we already go through WIC, we already go through public, public education system. Like you know who we are, you know where these people live, you know you have our data. If you don't have it, Amazon, Google, and Facebook do. <laughs> so like you, you could just just register us to vote and like mm -hmm. allow us to just go vote. It's pretty simple. I think actually you raised a really, another really important point, particularly uh, this morning when the uh, sham election commission is meeting just blocks from here, but that AVR also really does improve the, the security of uh, voter rolls in that, as you mentioned, Sarah, when people just update their information, it's not just about new voters, but it's also when people move and they share that information with the post office. A lot of people think that means like, I've told the government, that's cool, all my data will change and may not realize that their voter registration won't you know, move with them. And so therefore then they show up at the, at the ballot box or you know, at their new voter registration or uh, polling location and aren't on the rolls there. And then they're not able to actually like exercise their power that in that election. Um, so I think that the fact that uh, AVR is a really modern way to keep voter rolls up to date is important in this era when there's a, a lot more, uh, you know, a lot more uh, examination, very close examination of those voter registration rolls. Um, and, and for our generation, we're moving all the time, right? It's yes. particularly yes. important for young people. So much more when than you, people realize. Because maybe we're trying to get a job that pays us a decent wage. Maybe <laughs> our rent is too damn high, and so we got to find somewhere else to live now because the rent went up a ton, right? So that's the other piece that's really exciting about this is that if you update with a post office, it would follow you because mm -hmm. when you think, like, I'm trying to think how many times, at one point, I think I moved, like, three times within a three-year period maybe, yeah. but I know people have certainly moved way more than that. Um, so that's the other piece that like, yes, your information should follow you. The fact that this is why a lot of us are on college campuses all the time, right? Because you have to keep re-registering folks every single time that they move. Yeah. Like every year. Which is every single year. And so um, for those who are in residential uh, campuses, so this is where it just it's just one of those other common sense pieces that, yeah, it should follow you. And that's actually, um, I mean, that's another thing to remember about why the kind of registration barriers that folks like Chris Kobach have sought to impose um, on the citizens in Kansas, uh, you know, are putting at risk tens of thousands of Kansas citizens would have been prevented from registering had the ACLU not been successful in their litigation thus far against what Chris Kaubach is trying to implement, which is a documentary proof of citizenship requirement in order to become registered to vote. And I ask you, 
for anyone who's done a voter registration drive, actually, you know, <laughs> how many college students do you think are carrying their birth certificate or their passport <laughs> on their in their back pocket on their way to like English, you know, in the morning or whatever well, else? And, and, and let's be honest with Chris, with Chris Kobach, right? This is a guy who also wrote SB 1070, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. And so we know who he's talking about when he's trying to see. What is like, SB 1070? Your, SB 1070 is a show me your papers bill targeting people that look like me, people that look like Stevie, to be for the cops to just stop us and say like again prove that you're a citizen like he is not interested in making sure that folks specifically folks of color are engaged in this process and so the fact that he's associated with this at all and the white house is just like now nah, we like cannot even <laughs> like, it, nope. it is not good in any way this is a show me your papers law for becoming registered to vote even though every voter registration you know application when you opt in already requires you to swear on penalty of perjury that you are an eligible voter and a citizen of the country. So once again, this is just completely unnecessary. There's no real problem that any of these suppressive tools would actually solve. And then the real problems that we do face, uh, like, you know, Russia, poking and prodding, we might have to stick with hacking, but you know, for this morning, uh, you know, the, the, the attempts to interfere with our elections, that's some serious election security work we need to do in the next several months. That's not what's going on. This is just an investigation uh, of American voters. And I think Maggie, you'd raise a really great point about the kind of cynicism of millennials yeah. about the system and the deep distrust. Um, apparently one survey found that only 20% of millennials trust government. Um, and I'd ask, you know, how do you think affirmative policies like AV can help win back the trust of the millennial uh, generation, but particularly in the face of these cynical attacks on voting rights um, and the fact that these kinds of uh, sham commissions and attacks are really sending the signal that, like, don't participate and, you know, which might lead to even more cynicism and distrust yeah. amongst. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, there's a, there's a whole series of reasons why this would really um, sort of hit at the heart of millennial distrust in government. I think that not only would it free up time for those real conversations of democracy to happen, um, it would stop those sort of um, intimidating administrative moments that might face a new voter, a young person, um, you know, and, and those things are really, um, it, it, it makes it very difficult to re-engage that young person and bring them back. Um, in North Carolina, uh, just as an example, this past cycle, um, I was working to, um, as a volunteer to get folks out to vote, and then afterwards we had to do a provisional ballot chase because the governor's race was so close. So, we, you know, we were volunteering, calling people, um, asking, uh, you know, that had, had to cast provisional ballots, trying to figure out why. And a lot of times it would be because they had just moved addresses in the same county, so their um, polling place changed, but they didn't realize it, but they should have had their vote counted. But, you know, you have to then call people and say, um, unless you take documentation of your address down to the county office, um, your vote's not going to count in this election. And that's the system that we've set up. And like, really, are those the types of conversations that we want to be having with people who are overwhelmingly young and distrustful of the system? And I mean, I think young people, because of things like Trump's rhetoric, the Kobach Commission, um, I think people are skeptical of the system and do sense that people are trying to take away their votes. And there's a reason that our values aren't reflected in the elected makeup of this country or the candidates that we have to pick from. There's a reason that they don't look like us. And part of that is because these structural barriers have made um, uh, you know, people really successful at deadening our impact. And I, I think just one thing, I, but millennials are fighting back, I think just one example um, that I think really embodies um, not just our cynicism, that some people are trying to take something away from us, but also that we are willing to fight back. There was a young woman um, we were talking with who uh, had to vote a provisional ballot because she had moved in with her sister in the same county. And I remember she um, was at her polling place, which was a, was a fire station, and she actually, when they told her she would have, have to cast a provisional ballot, she said, you are trying to take away my vote. That is not right. And she didn't know what to do, but she was so fired up, she called 911. She was like, I called 911 <laughs> from the polling place because I knew that they were trying to take away my right to vote. <laughs> so we're willing to fight back. We know that this system is working against us. Um, I think that it's um, about time when it comes to voting, you know, you know, millennials feel like the system is rigged. We say, yes, you're right, but this is a way that we can fight back and get their trust in the system again. Yeah, to rebuild a system that works 
that works to facilitate participation for all so that government is reflective and responsive and actually working for the interests of all people. Yes. I think that's and for voters who do have questions in future, just remember one eight six six our vote or one eight six six Vea Vota is the actual hotline for yes. voters having problems yes. at the polling location. I say, Make a note. Is not the place yes, to call. That's the um, you know <laughs> shout out to friends who run that in the audience. So thank you. Um, so I do want to uh, you know, a lot of this is structural barriers and deep cynicism because government hasn't been serving the interests of all for a whole period of time and we're working on that with anti-corruption political reforms so that big money in politics doesn't have anti-democratic power also. I know that's uh, a deep part of the mistrust. Um, and maybe that's what is also leading to the fact that 93 million eligible citizens didn't vote at all in 2016. And that's, you know, exactly. When we're talking about, you know, voter participation in this country hasn't broken 60% since the 1960s. So a lot of this, you know, is definitely structural barriers and all of that. But I think to the question that someone asked earlier, you know, even for, and I should also say, people that are registered to vote, it was something like, 88% of the people registered to vote in 2012 actually voted. Mm. So you definitely see that like closing the registration gap, there are huge registration gaps between uh, uh, rates uh, as compared to like how wealthy you are, or again with younger versus older voters, or uh, white voters and some um, populations of color, although uh, black people are now registered really at the same rate nationally than white people, which has been a huge, uh, terrific gain. Um, but, and so that's why I think there can, is such an important focus on registration and removing that barrier. But, you know, what do you think uh, are some things that we can do in the larger sense, maybe Sarah, to engage, you know, young people so that they're excited about their right to vote and eager to exercise their power at the ballot box? So this is like one of like our favorite questions in the Alliance Youth Action because this is the stuff we jam on every single day. <laughs> um, so we are working to build power with youth organizations in states and localities across the country, um, and and this means that yes, we are engaging young people not just on election day in presidential elections, hmm. right? So if we like, and Chicago Votes is one of the killer affiliates that we work with, and this is, means that yes, we're going to register a ton of young people to get them to turn out like we did in 2016, but it also means like our crew in San Antonio registered I think around 1,300 voters between January and the um, May city council race that they had. And you know what happened in that city council race this past May versus two years ago? Youth voter turnout jumped from about 3% to 9%. Right? That's freaking huge. Yeah. This is, but it's because, again, yeah, Move was grinding so much getting up to November, and then they kept grinding mm -hmm. right afterwards to say, you know what, we have a city council race in San Antonio, seventh largest city in the country. There's the chance to make so much change in that community, and they're talking about things like immigration, and they're talking about things like housing, and they're talking about LGBTQ rights, right? They're meeting young people where they're at, and that's what we do at the Alliance. And so we're working with killer groups like Chicago Votes mm -hmm. as they're engaging on a host of economic issues there. We've got folks that are working on college tuition. We have people who are working on immigration and LGBTQ rights and voting rights. Like I said at the Oregon bus, they've just won pre-registration. Mm -hmm. There's so much great stuff that's happening, but this, this work happens and we get to talk about these wins because we have local organizations led by young people organizing young people year round. Don't talk to us come October before November election day. No, bye, yep. like, yep. no thanks. You actually don't care about our communities. Talk to me the day after election day about how we're gonna work together for the, until you're up again. And that's what like building young people power is. This is why we love doing this work because young people are killing it across the country. We're winning so much great stuff. There's a lot of noise here in DC. I'd say we got to focus to our states. Mm -hmm. How are we looking yep. at the work that the Washington bus is doing and their engagement on um, the mayoral race that's about to happen in Seattle? And like their incredible candidate survivor that they just did, y'all check it out online, <laughs> it's amazing, to what Ohio Student Association is doing year round. Um, to Engage Miami, who's about to uh, participate in um, and push young voters to engage in the special election that's happening there this fall, right? So we're doing the work year round. I think it's just about everyone else needing to catch up to where young people already are, because um, it's, there's, like, there's, a, there's a ton of magic out there, I'll just say. There's so much good. 
Yeah, but it's important to focus on exactly all the good things and to build power from those local spaces mm -hmm. to connect, again, connect voting that can seem kind of, if, if, it, if it ends up seeing just kind of like a dry process thing, then you get the my vote doesn't matter, you know, and I have to overcome mm -hmm. obstacles, et cetera, as opposed to like, I'm going to use my power to, uh, you know, change my local community and then continue. And I guess that's, you know, how do, uh, you know, voting rights intersect with these many other issues that millennials care about, and you know, how do you see um, folks using voting to then build their power to impact these other issue areas? Yeah, and really, just the whole. You know. I mean, I think everything that Sarah just said. A lot of it is localizing um, the issues that young people care about, and. Um, giving them those tangible bright lines between the issues they care about and the candidates that are on the ballot. I think that the, the area where this has been most powerful has been in criminal justice reform, where young people of color are leading movements to kick out district or city attorneys who are not prosecuting bad cops, right? So that is one area where we have seen um, an issue that young people are dealing with every day in their communities being tied specifically to a local election and lifting up the voices of young people. And I think that as, um, progressive organizations as people in the progressive movement, it's in just vital for us not just to talk about voting in a silo, like voting's important, democracy is important, your voice matters. All of that is a, is, is a good umbrella message, but we then have to be drawing those bright lines between the student that a young person is struggling with month to month, what is happening in their community to their friends who are undocumented, all of these issues. Um, what are the bright lines between that issue that is that young person's lived experience? And not just the presidential race, we do that a lot, but how about their county attorney race? How about their mayoral race? How about their city council, school board? All of those things. And I state think that that is state legislative races. And yes, the system is rigged. The maps were drawn to not include you. Here are the elections that we need you to participate in to fix that. Here is the ballot initiative or the state legislative um, calendar in your state. So I think that's... Um, it's not just enough for young people, given their level of cynicism, to talk to them about the importance of voting in a silo outside of tying it to the issues that they are experiencing every day. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a former student organizer, I will say that I think exactly the uh, being able to do a year-round conversation about power and exercising power outside the, you know, in many different entry points to the political system, but not to forget that voting is, you know, a, a key mm -hmm. necessary yeah. part of then moving the rest of these things as well. Um, so we're going to open up to audience questions. Um, does anyone have a question from the audience? Either that or we could keep. OK. Oh, great. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, Kate Hagman, in, um, uh, freelance editor. Thank you for taking my question. And um, I should begin this question by adding I'm from Maryland and I'm a registered voter and have a party affiliation. But in Maryland, we receive a sample ballot ahead of time with quite extensive information on how to vote, where to vote, um, plus ballot initiatives. And I'm not aware of what goes on in other states or how that material might best be gotten to younger voters who, of course, traditionally do not participate in things like midterms and whatnot on higher, in a high level. What is the best platform for reaching young voters? I hear people say, well, I don't know about these things. M my attitude is I have everything on my fingertips because of technology. Mm -hmm. But how are, you, how are you actually reaching young people that way. Thank you. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so one one interesting thing about uh, the millennial generation and Generation Z, who are now becoming eligible voters, uh, is we are the most distracted generation in American history. Uh, and like, <laughs> no, seriously, like we are the first generation that can post on Instagram, read an article, watch House of Cards, and iron clothes all at the same time. Um, so to answer your question, everything, every platform. I don't think there's one platform. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all model. I think there's a, you got to be everywhere. You got to be on Instagram. You have to be on Snapchat. You have to be on Facebook and the internet. But you also have to be 
uh, you have to do traditional stuff. You have to throw little ads up in the CTA, which is the Chicago the train system. You have to throw ads there that say, you know, online voter registration. You can go register to vote at this website. You got to, you know, do commercials. You have to do everything because we're distracted. We multitask. We look at everything. We're interested. Um, so if you put it everywhere, eventually it will we'll understand it. Well, I think one other like one of the biggest pieces here, and with all the different technology tools that are out there that Stevie listed, obviously important to engage online. But still, that person-to-person -person mm -hmm. contact mm -hmm. is number one. So if you think you're going to reach millennials by just doing a bunch of really expensive ads on Snapchat, like that is not going to pay off as much as paying an organizer year-round mm -hmm. to get on the doors, to work in communities, to build power with folks. The other thing, it's so real about the ballot being really long and confusing. Uh, we have a program called the American Voter Guide, which is a C4 voter guide that we distribute via mail, where we'll go to areas where there's a ton of young people and hand them out. And it just makes, it breaks down everything to what's this office, what, what the heck does this office do, who is running for it, who are some of the people endorsing them, and where do they stand on the issues with answers that are only yes or no. <laughs> um, which is a huge deal when working with yeah. candidates because typically you ask them a question they want to give you a paragraph of really confusing things almost like they're just throwing a campaign ad at you when we just really want to know yes or no where do you stand on these issues right and so the voter guides um, have been really really helpful to just make it easy for folks to understand um, our, our crew in Montana was using them during that special election we worked with folks um, in Georgia to have voter guides as, as well. And, and it's a program that we are kind of pushing out across the country to, again, just make it easier for people to make the decisions for themselves. We're not trying to say, hey, young person, like you need to fight for it, like vote for this thing. We're gonna say, here's the information that you need to make the best decision for you, your family, your community. Oh, there's a question in the back. How are you all doing? Good morning. Uh, thanks so much, Liz, for, for putting this together. Charles Ellison, uh, WRD Radio, also the Philadelphia Tribune. I'm based here in D.C. Real quick question. Um, that I got a lot of questions, but uh -huh. I'll try to condense this, and, and thanks for being here this morning. Um, first question, as far as, it's my understanding there are about, what, six states right now that are AVR, correct? And it, it seems like, with the exception of California and D.C., they're very, they're very white states, I mean, for the most part, even Oregon. Uh, these are these are not the most diverse states: Alaska, Oregon, Vermont, Connecticut. Uh, so, and and another thing too is that, with the exception of two states, what I think is Alaska and West Virginia, these are majority Democratic, or they're states that are dominated by Democrats. So, I, I guess the question is, you know, how do you encourage AVR in states that are more diverse? But it just so happens that those more diverse states are run by Republican governors and Republican state legislatures, and so. What's the game plan there nationally to change the uh, the composition of those state legislatures? I, I heard that kind of hinted at and touched on about a few moments ago. What's what's the game plan for that? Uh, so that's that's one question. One real quick, two question. Question two, if you allow me, Liz, if you can expound on this. You know, I hear a lot of of the issues that I heard thrown out. You know, there's sort of those classic sort of millennial issues, student loan debt, criminal justice reform. That comes up a lot, particularly when you talk about black voters, but you know, especially in a city like Philadelphia, which is high poverty, we're like the biggest uh, high poverty city in the country. People are like, you know what, I'm, I'm concerned about quality of life issues, mm -hmm. about paycheck to paycheck stuff, about paying my rent, uh, affordable living, uh, being able to pay my light bills. So what about those issues and sort of what, what's the game plan there for uh, encouraging millennials who are in, in really sh like uh, bad economic circumstances and are not so much they may not be as concerned about student loan debt or criminal justice reform as they are kind of making it day to day. Yeah. So what's the game plan for those issues as well? Thanks. Great questions. Thank you so much for being here, uh, Charles. Please. Yeah, I mean, I think, so on automatic voter registration, yep, super real. A lot of very white states have been ones who have been, who have uh, moved this legislation forward. I will say on Oregon, which is one of the really exciting uh, piece of information about that bill, smaller uh, uh, percentage of people of color in that state, but the gap between vote, uh, people of color and white registered voters like closed by about half. 
right? So certainly not the end all be all when it comes to the work we need to do to make sure folks of color are registered at rates of white folks, um, let alone just raising that number overall. Um, but promising, uh, promising news there. I think Chicago is a really great example of looking at uh, a more diverse state. And this is something that we're, we're ready to talk to folks across the country about ABR, right? If this is a, something you're interested in, especially when we've got uh, state ledges like in Illinois that are that unanimously passed an ABR bill, we think there's a lot of, of opportunity ahead. Um, on, on economic issues, yeah, I totally hear you. That's why I, this is like going to sound like a really cheesy PSA. That's one of the reasons why I started a campaign called Broke AF. Uh, to engage young people. We're a generation that grew up in the recession, whether we're on the older side and we're trying to get a job going into the re recession, or we're on the younger side and we saw our parents struggle with like the housing crisis, for example, right? So we're trying to meet young people on this issue that is number one for so many of our communities that, that frankly, like electeds haven't engaged us enough on. So we're gonna force them to do it. And for us, it means we're talking about wages, we're talking about housing, we're talking about uh, tuition and, and student loan debt. And, and student loan debt in a way, I think, and Maggie can talk a lot about this, a lot of times we'll, the narrative out in the public is, oh, student loan debt for people who go to really elite institutions. Student loan debt that is also an issue for a lot of people of color who are funneled into crappy for-profit colleges and have literally no degree and no way out to get on their feet. Um, so, yeah. No, absolutely. And I think that in addition to um, things like student don't loan debt um, being framed as economic issues and things like municipal minimum wage ordinances, I do think that there's an opportunity. And I think one of the things that's so heartening to me is that especially young elected officials at the municipal level have been really the ones helping to figure out those policy vehicles that will engage young people in their communities. I think um, one example, I was just um, in San Francisco and Jane Kim is the county su supervisor, a young um, woman in San Francisco and they were dealing with just um, a lack of revenues in the city and a lack of affordable housing for people with, with rent skyrocketing and that's something that hasn't been solved by any means but they um, constructed a ballot initiative that um, puts a property tax on homes that are valued more than five million dollars and then funneled the 44 million dollars a year that the in revenue that that generated into making city um, college of San Francisco the the city's community college free which is really something that overwhelmingly benefits um, people of color and young people and first generation college students. So I think that there's um, a really important uh, uh, you know, thing that young elected officials and really elected officials overall, especially at the lo local level, should be thinking about, which is how do you tie your procurement processes, your um, reven revenue generation, all of that directly, again, what is that bright line to an issue that people care about? Because that ballot initiative having that on there like, did bump turnout. Um, in that city. So I, I think that we do have a long way to go in terms of broadening this to other states. But I think that part of the way we do that is by really lifting up those young leaders. If it's an, a red state at the municipal level um, who are uh, pushing for those initiatives that are engaging young people. Can I, um, so like, I think Philadelphia and Chicago have a lot in common. Um, you know, we just passed it in Illinois. Uh, a lot of People don't realize this, but our, our governor is Republican. Um, the state of Illinois, uh, besides Chicago, is pretty red. Um, and we passed it through the legislature with no opposition. And the governor is going to sign it. He was supposed to sign it last week, but uh, the press conference fell apart. But he's going to sign it, like, any day now. Um, so it's going to be a thing in a diverse state. Um, it's going to be a thing in a Republican-led state. And I think that is like our strategies is the prime example to start with and build upon in order to do it in states that are similar to ours. In terms of the local issues, I hear you exactly what you're saying. You know, like I think a lot of times we talk about the traditional things that young people are dealing with um, and it kind of gets it kind of is repetitive, but like in Chicago, you know, there's more kids dying in Chicago than Afghanistan and Iraq. Like that is a real thing. And that's an economic thing. Like that is an economic problem. The economies on the south side of Chicago are illegal economies that are, you know, making people who don't look like the kids who are getting shot rich. Um, and so those are issues that we are trying to address. And you can address those issues by talking about these talking about those issues by removing voter registration as a barrier and something that we have to talk about. Just make sure everybody's registered and then we can talk about what you need to do to change what your community looks like. And that could be 
higher paying jobs, that could be tuition free college, that could be making sure that all the dumping sites in the city of Chicago aren't on the south and west sides of the city. That could be, you know, uh, making sure that we're investing in the tech industry, which is going to be the future of America, and making sure that these kids who don't really want to go to college because you go there, spend a bunch of money, learn a lot of things that you can't immediately say you're going to use and you get saddled down with debt. But we can start tech training programs in these communities and tell you once you finish this program, you're going to have this job and you're going to make a hundred plus thousand dollars a year. You won't have student debt and then you'll have a lucrative life that you see on TV. So uh, I think like on the local level, that's how we're doing it. And we're communicating with national groups like the Alliance for Youth Action that we're a part of, emulating our strategies in places like Oregon, uh, places like Chicago, places like Miami, talking to groups like the Center for American Progress to communicate what we're doing and how we're going about it to lawmakers and policy think tanks and other local groups across the country so they can see what's happening and really just taking it back to the grassroots and being an organizer, whether you're in the streets or whether you're running a policy think tank, we're all organizers at the end of the day and really trying to organize ourselves into a better economic situation and less voting barriers. Yeah, and I think that that is a uh, tremendously important point to uh, conclude on is that these issues of economic inequality and political inequality are inextricably linked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the point, you know, the fact that there is a 20 point registration gap between like 59% of people that make less than $25,000 are registered to vote, but over 79% of people who make over $100,000 are registered to vote. Like there are just some real realities in our our, our political system that have uh, you know, kept the voices of folks who are low income, who are of color, or have otherwise been on the margins of our political life from having the full power uh, of their voices and the strength of their communities reflected in determining who is governing our society and therefore the choices are being made by the, our elected representatives that then really, you know, determine so much of the kind of structural uh, opportunities that people either do or do not have uh, and then you know how they can support their own families in those in those systems so uh, we're gonna th it's been absolutely tremendous to have this conversation with you guys and all the work that you're doing uh, to fight for the future for communities we're gonna also keep fighting against uh, the voter suppression measures sure to come out of the uh, commission down the street um, and in fact just now we are also uh, have the opportunity to invite you all Maggie right. I'm sure you all thought oh I'm going to the Center for American Progress I'm gonna listen to a panel it's fancy policy, very refined, but we also wanted to invite you all to march out of the building with us to a rally that our partner, the Hip Hop Caucus, is right now. As of two minutes ago, it started in front of the White House. Um, it's the Respect My Vote rally um, to really rally against the pence Kobach Commission and for all of the things that we just talked about. So our Generation Progress staff members, where are y'all? Uh, I think they're out there in the lobby. Uh, they're going to have signs. Yes, there's Christian. Here's Hannah. We have signs that we're up oh, there it is yep uh, there it uh, is yep there it is that's the amber banner. with resist on a dowel who is going to be our protest cap captain we've got a megaphone we're going to do a little march out of here so we would love to have you join us if you're able thank you so much thanks so much for being here